All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we really appreciate you all taking the time out of your, I'm sure, very busy day to join our very first all virtual webinar. Today's session, 2020 Trends Surviving Today's Ever-Changing World, will be presented by John Simpson, One North CEO, Kalif Pikna, our Chief Strategist, and Jen Frost, our Managing Director of Marketing. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John Simpson to get us started. Thank you, Tanya. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar. I hope that uh, wherever you are dialing in from, you and your family are healthy and safe during this uh, pretty crazy time. Uh, as Tanya mentioned, this is, in fact, our first all-virtual webinar. I can also say that in 20 years of doing webinars, this is the first time I have presented with my school-aged children in the very next room, so hopefully that fact will not become painful during the course of the presentation today, and I'm sure you all can. But as I mentioned, the title of today's presentation is 2020 Trends, Surviving Today's Ever-Changing World. And really, when I think about <clears throat> this title, it's really the, the, the trends of the last six weeks, because I'm guessing we'd all agree that up until about early March, uh, 2020 felt a whole lot like 2019. But over the last six weeks, things have changed fairly dramatically. So what we're going to attempt to do today is to dial back the emotion a little bit, which is a little bit difficult to do, I know, um, but really become students of the situation uh, at hand. And when we do that, it becomes pretty clear that this is unparalleled from a marketing, technology, and digital perspective. And so what we're going to do today is really take a look at how brands are responding <clears throat> during the course of, um, of this pandemic. Uh, as Tanya mentioned, uh, I am delighted to be presenting with two of my longtime colleagues. So Kalav Pikna, who is our Managing Director and Chief Strategist, is on the line. Good afternoon, Kalav. Hello, John. Hello, everybody. And Jen Frost. Jen Frost is a Managing Director and heads up our marketing efforts at One North and has got more than 20 years working in marketing and digital. Hello, Jen. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. So with the introductions out of the way, let's go ahead and get going. Uh, I'm going to start today with a quote, a quote that's actually from McKinsey and dates back to 2009, the last time we had what would be considered a crisis uh, in this country. Um, so I'll read it aloud here. Uh, for some organizations, near-term survival is the only agenda item. Others are peering through the fog of uncertainty, thinking about how to position themselves once the crisis has passed and things return to normal. The question is, what will normal look like? Well, while no one can say how long the crisis will last, what we find on the other side will not look like the normal of recent years. I think we can all, all can agree that this quote rings as true today as it did back in 2009. But as you all know, the nature of this crisis is very different than that of 2009. 2009 was very much a financial crisis caused by dislocation in the financial markets, whereas this one might become a financial crisis, but, but the, the roots of it are really in something totally different something that's changing how we live our lives, how we interact with each other, how we buy products and services, and where we even work. Uh, at One North, the conversation that's really being occur been occurring with us and some of our clients has been around the fact that uh, we really think this is going to be a tremendous catalyst for transformation, both in terms of digital as a whole, uh, as well as customer experience. So talking about some of those changes, we thought we'd hit on a few of these to get started. Uh, we are seeing a lot of changes in terms of consumer behavior out there today. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think that as consumers, um, our preferences are now being formed differently. In fact, our preferences are being formed during the quarantine almost day by day. I read an article just yesterday that said that 60% of people are rethinking the products that are important to them as a result of this crisis. And I know that many of us, just in our own consumer behavior, are probably trying products and services that we've never tried before. And maybe that's an online, an online clothing store or experience because you can't go out and buy clothes. Or maybe it's going to a different grocery store because the one that you typically go to uh, might have had a COVID outbreak. Um, what this means is ultimately either an opportunity or a threat for businesses because trial is occurring and we have to recognize that. Uh, secondly, you know, new experiences and service models are popping up all over the place. And we'll talk a lot about this today, particularly as it relates to healthcare, where we're seeing a lot of changes in uh, experience and service models. Technology, uh, digital innovation will definitely grow exponentially as a result of this. We're seeing some of the biggest technology players out there uh, completely refocus their businesses on adaptation to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, particularly Microsoft and Amazon, which we'll mention in a minute. I think it's really interesting to think about in-person events. 
I know we're all wondering uh, what will business travel look like uh, when we get back to air quotes, new normal or normal. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately, but what I think is amazing is that for me, when I see my 75 year old father sending me invites for Zoom meetings, I know that this crisis is causing changes in technology adoption across all demographics and all age groups. And so that change is no doubt here to stay. Um, we're all, I'm sure, grappling with the, uh, the work from home challenge and I can say at One North, we've always had the work from home capability and a lot of the collaboration tools in place, but we're finding new use cases every single day uh, on how to use those tools. And it's also forcing us, like it, I'm sure it's forcing your businesses to rethink how you interact with your customers. So for us, that oftentimes means how do we brainstorm with customers in an engaging way when we're doing it virtually, um, which is again, totally different. And finally, some of the major changes that we're seeing is supply chain changes. Uh, we'll see a major overhaul in supply chains some of the best in the game are really struggling right now with things like next day delivery, uh, and that's creating opportunities for other competitors and new service models and delivery models uh, in, in the supply chain as well. So for the discussion today, we've really taken some of the best examples that we've seen over the last uh, six weeks in terms of how brands are responding to uh, this challenge. And we've bucketed them into four main areas for inspiration, and in some cases, and some cautionary tales, desperation. Uh, and we'll go through those today, but the main topics today are going to be speed and resiliency, connections and communication, innovation and purpose, and expertise and innovation. So let's start with speed and resiliency in the face of this crisis. Um, I think the simple fact is, and, and probably all of us are feeling it, is that almost every business right now is in an adapt or die situation. I know personally I've been pretty amazed to see the speed with which almost all businesses have pivoted in the face of this crisis. Um, I'm sure you can look at your organization, whether you think it's a typically fast moving organization or a slow moving organization, and, uh, and you can find examples where you've been impressed with how quickly they've responded. Um, we're hearing stories from all over the place from organizations that typically didn't work from home that are buying a thousand laptops over a weekend and setting them up and getting them out to their employees so that they can be up and running the following Monday. To, uh, I read an article yesterday about the Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, notoriously, uh, notorious, I should say, for bureaucracy in California and New York has moved um, most of their services, thankfully not driving tests, online. Uh, who would have thought it? So, so speed and resiliency are critically important, and we're seeing uh, that in all of our businesses today. And just to showcase how important it is, I thought I'd just talk for a minute about um, Amazon and Microsoft. So some of you might have seen that Jeff Bezos at Amazon came out with a letter to the Amazon employees that was eventually um, posted on Instagram, a four page letter. And in that letter, he said, look, basically long-term planning, plans we had before COVID-19, those are on the back burner right now. We are 100% focused on adapting our business to COVID-19. And we saw the same thing come out from CEO Satya Nadella from Microsoft, who basically said we are moving all of our services um, to adapt to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I think what, what we should take away from that is when we see these leaders making statements like that, is that these leaders believe that this change, this crisis is going to cause uh, an impact that is both major and also permanent. So that probably means that all businesses need to be asking themselves some key questions about their business models, how they deliver their services, how they engage with their employees, and ultimately how they prepare for their future. So now uh, we're actually going to take a look and see how some of those businesses are actually responding and adapting. So I want to talk a little bit about rethinking service delivery and fast. We've seen some fantastic examples of this, particularly in the, uh, the healthcare space. So if you think about the healthcare relationship and your relationship with your doctor, that's a very personal relationship. Typically met in person, it's just you two. You're obviously talking about something important like your health. Um, that can't go away, uh, or that interaction can't go away, uh, even amidst the, the COVID-19 outbreak. And patients still want to see their doctors. Doctors still want to see their patients. They just want to do it in a safe way. And what we've seen in the healthcare space is that telehealth, which has been around for a while, has just taken off. With the relaxation of some HIPAA laws, um, and the adoption, the need to adopt uh, telehealth, this is now a thing. And the way that I've been thinking about its adoption is very similar to that of online matchmaking that many of you probably recall from 20 or 25 years ago. When online matchmaking or online dating came about, 
none of us believed that that's the way that people would interact with these very personal experiences. But fast forward to 2020, and we all know plenty of people who met uh, over that medium. So it's clear that telehealth uh, and that way of uh, delivering uh, the physician services is definitely here to stay. I'd even go so far as to make a prediction, and that's that with the rise of telehealth, we're going to see a lot of advancements in connected health technology. So things like wearables that we've all had for many years are only going to get better and provide more data for our physicians that can then act on that data, even if we're not physically in the same room with them. Another great healthcare example uh, is Amazon. So pretty early in the crisis, Amazon actually came out on March, March 23rd and announced that they were going to be providing delivery uh, and at-home pickup of COVID-19 testing kits in the Seattle area. When you think about the, the pivot here and how fast they had to move uh, to jump on this opportunity, um, it's quite amazing. I mean, the, the idea that they're probably only going to be delivering these kits to people who feel like they have symptoms and they're probably going to be picking up these kits from people that actually do have COVID-19, that presents a tremendous logistical challenge. And yet, on March 23rd, very early in the crisis, they already committed uh, to providing that service. Uh, another great example from healthcare uh, is chatbots. So I think chatbots are finally seeing uh, some less gimmicky use cases. And, and here's one that I really, really like. Uh, Sentara Health and many other health systems have actually launched chatbots to help in the pre-triaging of patients for COVID-19. So we all know that we're attempting to, to flatten the curve. And um, hospitals all over the place are being inundated both in their emergency rooms as well as through their phone lines with people calling in that think they have the symptoms of COVID-19. So Sentara Health and some other health systems in a matter of weeks have been able to stand up a chatbot that they're putting on their websites and in other locations that allow potential patients or people think, that think they were infected to go on, go through a quick survey of their symptoms, and then the chatbot will inform them the best location for them to go, whether that's to come into the ER, whether that's to call their physician, uh, or whether or not they, they likely aren't exhibiting uh, significant symptoms of COVID-19. This is having a huge impact in terms of the load on the hospital systems that are using it. Uh, some non-healthcare examples that I think are really interesting. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, Fleet Feet Sports. Fleet Feet, if you aren't familiar, is a, I believe, national running store that has local locations, um, specialty running uh, store, I should say. And they very quickly launched the ability to provide contactless curbside pickup. So you can go online, whether that's through mobile or through your desktop, order the product from the store that's nearest to you, and then pick it up without ever going inside or certainly without ever uh, touching anything, whether that's your credit card or anything else. And I think this is a fantastic example of obviously pivoting very quickly to provide a service in a new way, but it's also thing, something that's going to be here to stay post-COVID. I know myself as a runner, I buy new shoes about every four or five months. I hate to buy them online because typically I'm buying them on a sunny day when I, I want to go running right away. But what I don't like is going to the running store every four or five months and having to tell them the exact same shoe that I'm buying repeatedly. Well, now I can use this service, you know, hopefully post-COVID-19, to order up my shoes, drive over to the running store, pick them up at curbside, uh, and be off and running, bad pun intended, uh, very, very quickly. Some other examples we're seeing, uh, we're probably all familiar with West Elm, the, the furniture store. Um, they are now offering virtual consultations, and this is smart for so many reasons. Uh, for one, I think we're obviously all spending a lot of time in our homes. Uh, and likely are looking around and feeling like things need to be spruced up a bit. Uh, but secondly, um, inviting a consultant physically into our home feels like a pretty big commitment for most of us and probably feels a little bit invasive and feels like something that I would feel committed to buying if I have this consultant in my home. So it probably means that having somebody physically come to my home um, is not necessarily going to encourage a lot of trial. Well, now that they moved online, I think a lot of people are going to see that barrier removed and be much more comfortable um, allowing these consultants to virtually come into their home rather than physically come into their home and not feel as committed. And what that means is that people are going to take more advantage of this service than they did if they had to have the consultant come in physically. Furthermore, it's brilliant from West Elm's perspective because if this takes off, their consultants can now see a lot more clients during the course of the day uh, if they're doing these meetings virtually than if they were doing these consultations in person. So great example of uh, rethinking service delivery. So finally, uh, I can't say I have personal, uh, personal experience with this particular brand, 
but this was sourced from the uh, smart folks at uh, One North. Uh, Flowers for Dreams is a regional florist, and they are known for conducting workshops in their stores on how to create floral arrangements and how to pot plants and do things like that. Uh, they have very quickly pivoted to providing virtual workshops. So not only are they Zooming uh, their workshops, but they will actually send you all the materials you need to participate in that workshop, including the dirt and the plants and everything else. So really amazing pivots when you think it's really only been, you know, four to six weeks here. But in terms of speed, we've also seen some in, uh, interesting pivots as it relates to how organizations are packaging their content. And I think a wonderful example of that is Zoo Lily. So if you're not familiar with Zoo, Zoo Lily, they sort of define themselves as an e-commerce company that sells toys and clothing and home products and things like that. I personally sort of feel like they've nailed a customer insight with the way they're, they're packaging their content. Um, like many of you, uh, now that my kids are home 24 hours a day, I need to provide a mix of educational, family, and personal activities to them on an everyday basis. And Zoo really understands that. They understand that customer insight and they package their content in such a way to be able to provide educational toys, games and puzzles, uh, toys, uh, and pretend play toys. So toys for the family, toys uh, for fun on your own, and toys that can be used for education. Just skipping to uh, another example here, um, Universal Standard, you can probably tell I don't use their services either, uh, based on the picture here. Um, but they're using a term that I think has been coined through uh, the course of the COVID-19 outbreak, and that is video call appropriate. We all know what business formal is and business casual is. Well, now we have video call appropriate, and they're packaging up their uh, clothing in such a way. So it's sort of business on the top and comfy on the bottom uh, and selling, um, selling their products in that manner. So finally, an example that I'll, I'll list here in terms of uh, content being relevant, repackaging content quickly in response to COVID-19 um, is, is the Khan Academy. So the Khan Academy uh, was founded in 2008. It's a non-for-profit and was, its original mission was to provide online education. Um, they are really taking this opportunity and running with it. So they have now packaged their content. So you can log on whether you're two years old, you probably need a little help if you're two, but two to 18 years old, they've got specific daily schedules of content that you can access uh, for educational opportunities. So they're providing not only the content, but the structure and the routine that I think a lot of uh, kids are craving right now. Furthermore, they're also providing tools for teachers, right, who are uh, struggling to uh, deal with uh, the sort of teach from home situation that they're all stuck in as well. So a couple of great examples here. I didn't go through the, uh, the paper source example of how organizations are thinking from their customer's perspective in order to refocus their content and be relevant and doing that fast and in a resilient way. So we've got some great examples of speed and resiliency over the last six weeks. And I thought I'd wrap up with a quick framework for how we're thinking about the crisis. Um, this is a model that's from McKinsey. Uh, and it talks about the five horizons that we all need to think about at some point. And it's pretty straightforward, but I, I think it's, it's still pretty powerful. Uh, the first is resolve. And I suspect most of us are either in this or through this at this point, but this is just how do I stand up my business uh, right away and sort of triage uh, what's happening. And as I said, I think most businesses are probably most of the way through this. The second phase is resilience. And this is more financial in nature, but thinking through, okay, if we don't know how long this uh, crisis is going to last, how do we make sure our cash lasts? And how can we be smart, uh, smart around the economics of cash flow uh, and making sure that uh, we're in it for the long haul and resilient financially? The third is return. So, you know, we're not all just going to go back to work uh, at once. And so returning to scale of our business is probably going to look different than anything we've seen before. So that's a horizon we need to consider. But the fourth and fifth, I think, are particularly interesting. Reimagination is taking the learnings that we've had over the last uh, you know, six weeks and for however long this goes on and baking them back into our business model in a really smart way that reinvents our business. And finally, what will inform that is reform, right? This horizon for what is the competitive landscape and the regulatory landscape going to look like after all this? Because that certainly is going to affect how we reimagine the future. So you don't have to think about all of these at once. I think that would be tremendously overwhelming. But ultimately, being resilient will require that there's an examination of all these things. And I think it's a pretty good uh, sort of rubric, if you will, uh, for thinking about the future. So with that discussion of speed and resiliency, I thought I'd hand it off to Jen, who's going to talk about connections and communications. 
Great. Thanks, John. Um, so we've seen quite a lot of communications going out, and most of us have been involved with communications, whether it's with internal audiences or external audiences. Um, but it really has, in such a quick time frame, required quite a lot of thought in terms of making sure that key constituents, key audiences know exactly what's going on. Um, I think that it goes without saying that there have been, um, over the last couple of weeks, maybe a couple of unfortunate, unfortunate email communications. And um, I'm sure some of you have seen sort of those memes out there, which sort of talked about that. But um, I think across the board, initially we saw a lot of communications that were, you know, around um, COVID-19. But in some cases, it really sort of surprised people that a brand uh, actually knew who they were or didn't remember necessarily giving them their email address. Um, so you had a couple of responses to these. The first was, uh, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know, sort of um, uh, companies that maybe don't have such a close relationship from a brand perspective, uh, brand aspect. Um, the second is there were folks who sort of took the opportunity to make a sales pitch, which felt um, sort of uh, bad timing in terms of that. And then the last one was sort of, wait, who? Um, which is, you know, those people that you don't actually ever remember giving your email to, and quite honestly, you don't remember what it is that they do. So, um, you know, there, there definitely were sort of the first wave of email communications um, were a little bit hit, hit or miss. And understandably, people were just trying to get information out very fast. And there were a lot of updates where you would get an email that was sort of like an update from our CEO or our CEO's perspective. Um, but now I think we're sort of moved past some of that and um, we'll show you some examples of what people are doing. I will say that in the unfortunate um, category, there were a couple that did kind of stand out. Um, this is, was from an article that we were reading. Um, the first was, you know, the content that you may have set up to send as a campaign um, or could also be sort of advertisement placements that you've already bought um, that ran at this time. And the one of the examples that we have here is Spirit Airlines, where it says it's never better time to fly. Um, obviously, I think all of us would say it's probably nobody is flying much these days. So that was, you know, just an unfortunate timing sort of a, um, a communication. Um, the second is from a jeans company, a company that sells um, blue jeans. Um, and it was very interesting. I thought this one was particularly uh, of note because first of all, I spent the first part of the conversation or the email talking about what it is that they're doing to sort of help um, mitigate any risk of um, COVID-19 in their uh, manufacturing plants and um, in their business. And then, oh, by the way, um, we'd love to give you a 50% off sale if you would like to use it. It just felt, again, a little bit toned up in, these day, in this day and age. And the last one was actually directed towards me. It was an email um, solicitation um, that sort of was uh, sounded a little bit like my grandmother um, sort of laying on the disappointed um, uh, hat sort of saying, Jen, we've done all the work so far. We're a little disappointed that we haven't heard back from you. And obviously, um, this didn't go over that well with me. I was sort of like, uh, there's a pandemic going on. <laughs> it's not exactly the right time to pick up the phone and have a sales call. So just some examples of um, maybe a few unfortunate examples of emails. But, you know, it's always good to remember and for all of us communicators and marketers just to think about when we are communicating with our clients, you know, what's in it for them? Um, am I telling the customer something different from other brands? Am I telling them something that they, they don't already expect of my company or brand? Is, you know, what actually, what value am I providing to them? Um, and I think this idea of value and support um, is really important from brands right now, thinking through exactly how um, either the information that you have or the services that you provide or the experiences that you provide can actually help your customers in an incredibly stressful time. Um, this, was a, this is a really cool example um, to the right of this slide where um, CBS All Access decided to give away free access to their um, to their service and they used um, Patrick Stewart to sort of announce it. And the cool thing about this is that, yes, you're getting free access for a month, but the idea is that, you know, they're thinking that, you know, post 
that month that you'll continue you'll like their product so much that you'll continue to be a subscriber of theirs but it was just kind of a nice like what's in it for them like they thought about you know people everybody's at home let's open this up let's give people access to it with the hopes that you know a certain percentage will decide to sign on moving forward um, so just like looking at some of the categories that we've seen in terms of communications, um, there are some really, really good emails and communications um, and email is an incredibly useful uh, mechanism for communicating with a large group of people. Here's a couple that have come from um, various brands that are telling you exactly sort of what you can expect from their brand as it relates to what's going on right now. And these are all brands that, you know, we would likely still be using. So CVS Pharmacy, um, you know, how do you get deliveries? Um, can you do a vi video visit? Can you still get a flu shot? Sort of all the things that you might be asking, they've sort of packaged that up. Um, FedEx, you know, telling you about what would you know what are the requirements now and do we still need delivery signature updates um how do you do business with them in this day and age and then the last one is lyft um you know some folks might still be needing to take um, either public transportation or uber or lyft so again sort of outlining what they're doing to make sure that if you are taking advantage of that right now you know, what you can expect from them. So a couple examples of some good, helpful email communications. We've also seen a lot of brands kind of dig into, um, you know, using this as an opportunity to highlight some of their corporate social responsibility policies um, and efforts right now. And um, again, this kind of goes to make the experiences that you have with these brands a little bit more personal and you get a little bit of a sense of, um, how they're responding to and supporting um, different causes right now. Most of these obviously have to do with first responders. Um, so the first one is from a jewelry company talking about, um, you know, if you buy um, if you buy certain products at this time, we'll give 50% of the pro um, the proceeds directly to um, the America's COVID-19 Response Fund. Um, Rothy's, which is a shoe company, um, talking about supporting there are um, supporting the heroes and talking about donations being made to direct relief. And then this last one, another one from um, Flowers for Dreams, um, one of my favorite companies, so I had to put this in. So they are sort of sending flowers to um, frontline workers. So it was kind of a, a cool way of bringing their product to um, the front lines and also showing how thankful they are to all the support that we're getting. So you know, you're seeing a lot of sort of goodwill as it comes to communications. And then quite frankly, you're seeing some really fun communications around feel good um, type of things and very human. I think that's one of the key points is that um, now more than ever, it's okay to be human and to recognize that, you know, it stinks right now. Um, and how are you doing? There's a couple of, of um, good examples here. Um, where they're talking about some of those. My favorite, so there's the one in the middle is actually from a local store here um, and sort of talking about these are my core teed favorites that spark joy. So you can actually buy from a local um, shop and she's packaged up some of her favorite things. It's a t-shirt and, um, you know, a candle and some other things as sort of like a COVID package, obviously also helping local stores. Um, but the one on the right is kind of my favorite. It's Kate Spade. Kate Spade obviously has like a very whimsical um, brand as it stands so that they've used this as an opportunity to say sort of, hey, we thought of some things that you can do with your friends. So they have like 10 different ways to be together. They have ideas around virtual movie night, uh, virtual closet swap, virtual cocktail party, quiz night, dinner party. So things that you can do with your friends to kind of keep you sane and connected. Um, and I think that there's what we're seeing now, the first wave we saw where it was sort of like an update from our CEO or like what we're doing about the COVID situation. Now we're seeing communications really starting to um, uh, blend together. And in this case, you see um, Walmart is essentially has information about how you can get in touch with them, followed by um, details about ways to declutter your house. So they have one piece of it is all about, you know, 
doing business with them, what you need to know. And the second piece has to do with practical tips about getting your house um, back in order because, you know, obviously we're all spending a ton of time there. And then when you click through to the site, you actually get to um, a point where you can get two products that will help you with your reorganization. The one downside I will say to that is that I noticed that some of the products that they had down here were actually out of stock, <laughs> including some of their cleaning products. Um, and I think what John said before about sort of the supply chain, um, just an example of it, you know, when Walmart runs out of things, um, you know, that uh, there has definitely been a lot of hoarding going on. So this was an article actually that Kalev shared with me this morning and I decided to uh, put it in because I thought it was a really good reminder is that all of these emails that um, brands are sending, um, they may not necessarily be calming to customers. If you start looking through your email and you're getting um, emails from lots of different brands and sort of the headlines are sort of, you know, our response to the crisis or crisis communications in the time of COVID or all these types of things, it's just heightening the anxiety um, that your audience already has. And I think in these, this day and age, it's worth thinking about who your key audiences are and what might be a more meaningful uh, touch point with them. Um, this article goes through to talk about how for Brooks Brothers, many of their sales associates are actually writing handwritten notes to um, their top customers as a way of reaching out in a more personal fashion. And I will say that um, as a plug to Big Blue Swim School, um, which is um, uh, owned by one of our employees' uh, husbands, um, my son got a personal letter from his swim instructor just telling him, Max, that he, they missed him very much and they can't wait to see him back in the pool. And it was a very sweet and thoughtful connection that I think that we all can think about. And, you know, one of the things to really consider is that a lot of these small businesses are probably leading the charge when it comes to these, um, you know, sort of guerrilla tactics when it, as it comes to sort of being more personal. Um, the couple of pictures that we have here with the one on the left is um, a sandwich shop um, in the North Shore here that if you order from them, they kind of just treat you to um, an extra cookie that says thanks for your support. It's not that you ordered it. They just wanted you to know that they appreciate you supporting them. Um, the one in the middle is a um, boutique owner um, on the East Coast who has been thinking about ways to essentially continue having virtual styling app appointments. Um, and then sort of sending out um, materials via the mail. So she's got sort of these packages going out to her clients. And then the one on the right, um, I actually love. It's a greeting card company called Dear Hancock that has two stores in, um, in uh, Los Angeles that had to close and they were trying to figure out what they could do. And they decided to kind of come up with, I mean, the only way I can say it is COVID appropriate <laughs> greeting cards. And I kind of love this one, which says keep home and Fauci on, um, but they have a whole bunch of things that you can, greeting cards that you can buy for healthcare workers, for your UPS driver who comes and delivers, for US mail. So, you know, thinking sometimes outside of email and considering who your audience is, it may actually make more sense to do something a little bit more personal um, and maybe a little bit more old school. So with that, I will turn it over to Kaliv. Thanks, Jen. We wanted to take a look um, even beyond the communications that a lot of companies uh, are putting out there and take a look at companies that have been able to connect what it is they actually do as a business and address the current situation. So diving in, um, we'll start with uh, IDEO, which uh, you may know as an innovation or uh, service design agency. And um, as you can imagine, I think a lot of their normal efforts and normal engagements are probably disrupted by the current situation, but they were able to pivot very quickly um, at the beginning of this challenge and leverage their skill set, which has to do with um, uh, broad set, uh, human-centered design, design thinking approaches, and directly address the current situation. So they're leveraging their expertise, and they did so in a very publicly accessible way. So they launched a challenge which invited literally anybody to participate 
um, to help solve the question that you see here in the slide. How might we rapidly inform and empower communities around the world to stay safe and healthy during the COVID-19 outbreak? Um, so it's a space that we're gonna continue watching and it was impressive to see them pivot um, so quickly and stay uh, true so directly to what it is they do as an organization. Perhaps a little less uh, predictable um, we also saw it from the fashion industry. So Christian Siriano, um, sometime darling of Project One Way and now Couturier uh, for the red carpet, um, made a lot of headlines when he directly, directly reached out to Governor Cuomo of New York um, and offered to take his workforce um, consisting of tailors, pattern makers, um, and highly experienced sewers um, and pivot their operations to work on masks, uh, face masks at a time when they were, well, everybody was facing very critical shortages. Um, and of course this did get him uh, a lot of good press, but you, you can imagine it's not the, the sort of press that's directly related by, with some sales or marketing strategy. Um, it's really sort of a gratuitous benefit um, that comes out of what is authentically a very earnest uh, attempt to uh, take the uh, excess resources that he has on hand and uh, direct them um, in a productive direction. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, perhaps unpredictable, um, you can see businesses uh, such as Cobalt Distilleries, which is a sort of small batch handmade distillery based uh, in Chicago, where I live, um, uh, made a similar maneuver um, by taking their production equipment, um, staff and expertise uh, and instead of producing alcohol to imbibe, um, producing alcohol-based sanitizer that they've already begun to deliver um, into the hands of the people that need it the most. Um, and so I think what you're beginning to see here is that it, it kind of doesn't really matter what your business does. Um, you're seeing a lot of different varieties, types of businesses uh, find ways uh, to connect their efforts uh, to the current crisis. Um, some of those businesses are not product companies, they don't make physical things, some of them are technology companies. So Adobe um, has long had a presence uh, within schools um, and has always had uh, some discounts uh, offered to educational institutions and to students. Um, but they realized that those uh, long-standing discounts weren't going to cut it um, as students left campuses um, to 100% uh, remote distance learning um, remote or slash distance learning context. Um, many of the students had licenses that only worked on premises or when they were accessing um, those tool sets from within uh, dedicated networks. So um, what they realized is that it was gonna be immensely disruptive to uh, the, their actual education. So they started offering, offering just free access to Creative Cloud, which if you're familiar, um, which if you're not familiar with includes names uh, that are a little bit more prominent like Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. Um, now these students can access those, um, they can keep their educations on track. Um, and of course, it's an, uh, an incredible uh, opportunity to show loyalty in the other direction. They want to engender loyalty amongst that set. This is a great way for them to say, hey, we can be loyal to you as well in a moment of crisis. Um, and of course, B2B organizations and service organizations um, ha, are, are uh, similarly also a part of the same trend. So Paul Weiss, along with many other uh, prominent law firms, their law firm based in New York, um, known primarily for doing very high-end B2B corporate law work, um, they were able to take their staff um, and quickly organize um, a pretty robust pro bono effort that would help um, businesses of all size navigate some really complex issues. You can imagine those start with a lot of labor employment issues, moving um, large amounts of staff to a work from home context. Um, but as you can also imagine, includes a lot of other sort of knock on um, questions and effects uh, where businesses really need a lot of guidance in um, deciding what to do in a situation that's really unprecedented where there are, isn't a lot of precedent uh, to turn to to understand you know, what is legally required? What are my obligations? Um, how can I help um, and still stay within the rules? And finally, we thought we'd be remiss if we didn't point out at least some lighthearted 
effectiveness um, in this. And it's a, it's a way of showing that contributions um, can be meaningful and, and connecting to your purpose can be meaningful and still also be fun. So Natty Light, uh, which you may know by its more professional brand name, Natural Light Beer, uh, <laughs> recognize that a lot of students are missing out, um, particularly university students are missing out on um, a really special moment in their lives of commencement um, this coming May. So they have organized um, a sort of collective uh, nationwide commencement uh, celebration. They've gotten a lot of the celebrities and big names to join in. Um, and I, for one, even though I am several decades removed from my own college comm commencement, I'm probably going to tune in just to see what it's all like. Um, so it's just to show that, you know, you can uh, connect what you do as a business um, to the situation. You can provide help. Um, you can provide special moments, um, regardless of what kind of business you're in. The last section or major set of trends that we wanted to take a look at really focuses in on those kinds of businesses who have always had um, the provision of expertise and information at the core of their brand. So these are businesses that, um, you know, you've, we've seen businesses where some retail brands um, reach out and try to provide uh, helpful information when, you know, for the most part, they're usually marketing their products. The businesses we're going to take a look at now, primarily professional services firms, these, these folks have always um, provided expertise and information, but they're taking it in, in new and really interesting directions in the current context. So diving in, we'll uh, start with PwC, uh, formerly known as PricewaterhouseCoopers. You guys know them as a bit, one of the big four accounting consulting firms. Um, this example, which they put up uh, very quickly, the COVID-19 Navigator, is impressive, not just because of its robustness, but with which the speed that PwC was able to get it up and running. It was up and running by about mid-March, um, which is when many localities hadn't even put in their shelter in place uh, uh, orders. Um, and it's been expanded on since then. So it contains a pretty robust tool set. It's a collection of thought leadership and information, uh, data visualizations, um, and other resources to help companies think through, um, you know, how their, their response area is on a lot of different dimensions. Um, and operations, supply chain, marketing, uh, strategy, um, you name it, this resource probably has some information about it. And we'll see how some of those other themes get played off in the other examples. Next up um, is Plant Moran. Uh, they are a national uh, accounting tax uh, advisory firm. Uh, they similarly put together a very quick very quickly, a number of different articles. This, this is kind of a snapshot of um, what they had on hand even by mid-late March. Um, as you can imagine, there are a lot of tax implications to um, what's happening, a lot of uh, financial implications uh, about what's happening that a number of companies need to think through relatively quickly. Um, and they moved very quickly to put it front and center on their homepage and to really back it up with a range of articles coming at it from several different directions at once. Morgan Lewis, uh, uh, this coming in uh, more directly from the legal sector, addressed many of the, the, the very first sets of questions that we saw a lot of companies having. So um, as we mentioned earlier, um, uh, the area of labor and employment law was one of the first uh, areas of really rapid activity and questions that a lot of businesses had. Um, how to address uh, the work from home situation, how to address continuity and benefits, um, how to address uh, the need to size their staffs correctly. Um, so they very quickly jumped in, um, similar to Plant Moran, with a, a full range of information um, about COVID-19 and how they can answer very specific questions, um, really providing this publicly on their website. Um, and it really gave them a very strong presence in the conversation very early on. Uh, from the financial sector, we saw COVID, uh, Goldman Sachs, a uh, storied New York uh, investment banking firm, uh, provide a, a similar range of information. Um, you know, I think these, uh, this answers a lot of questions that we probably all have on the general macroeconomic situation. Um, of course, there are no like hard answers right now, but they are still providing ways for people to think through. Um, and uh, 
useful guidance to companies about which numbers that they need to be paying attention to the most. It's not all based on website activity, and I think this is important to put on. So, so far, those four examples that I've just talked through um, are examples of companies that put together large collections, they've hosted on their websites, they've provided sort of resource centers. I think it's worth mentioning that um, utilizing social at a time like this uh, can be just as effective. Um, so you can see here a range of businesses from research businesses like Forrester, which you might um, expect to offer a lot of guidance. So they're out there doing a lot, um, offering a playbook for different kinds of marketing communications uh, in this crisis. Law firm Schiff Harden uh, um, to address the uh, launching similarly a sort of task force um, around the pandemic. Three to boutique uh, professional service firm. So this one comes from uh, RS21, um, which is a sort of UX and design firm based in the Southwest. Um, and they're offering uh, their unique perspective on the crisis as well. And all of these examples coming in through LinkedIn, um, which can be a, a little faster, more nimble, um, and less resource intensive than putting together an entire resource center on a website. Uh, one of the areas in which we wanted to call this out in particular was that, you know, a lot of the most helpful resources have not been uh, copy-based articles, but have actually really focused in on data visualization. So we wanted to call attention to this because it really seems like this is a moment in which uh, data visualization is gaining a lot of attention. Um, you've probably all seen different trackers of different sorts on various websites attached to different articles. You know, it, it's happening um, not just because of the moment-by-moment -moment nature of this uh, current situation and the need for us to, to pay attention to changes quickly, but also because, uh, you know, the, um, this issue in a lot of dimensions, whether it's really just understanding it from an epidemiological standpoint or understanding the economic impacts, um, requires talking about some really complicated um, issues um, and changes um, where really just showing people what the data looks like is a far more effective uh, than writing uh, paragraphs trying to explain the same thing. What I think is interesting about the examples we have here on the slide is that they really range in terms of the visualization style and the level of effort uh, put into the design. And I think the, the takeaway is that they're all effective. And so not every single type of data visualization needs to involve um, a significant amount of technological or even design investment. So up in the top right, you have um, the COVID tracker from Johns Hopkins, uh, which has gotten a lot of traffic and a lot of uh, side commentary, um, positive side commentary uh, in the press for being really robust, helping people understand um, the sort of day over day uh, changes that are happening in a lot of the numbers that people are tracking from a medical or epidemiological standpoint. Um, we at One North um, had a number of conversations and noted the effectiveness uh, sort of from the opposite direction towards the left, the top left, that um, sometimes even the simplest state of visualizations can be the most effective in communicating uh, difficult concepts. So this is really just a hand-drawn um, concept where they've paired the uh, sort of literal definition of the curve with some um, uh, really just hand-drawn cartoon-based explanations to help people understand what does that concept mean and why is it important. And finally on this slide, um, just anecdotally, anecdotally, sometimes not even the most robustly visualized things are the most effective. So in the bottom left is a simple table-based layout of um, really key statistics that uh, have proven very popular within the medical community this year in Chicago as the one that they're all turning to because it really gives those providers, namely the doctors and nurses on the front lines, very clear communication of the stats that they need to do their sort of day-over-day -day planning. So even though it's just a table um, layout, this happens to provide the clearest information and the most direct information on the sort of day-over-day -day changes that they need. Um, continuing with the visualizations, most of these examples come from the New York Times uh, and specifically from the upshot uh, section of the New York Times. And as a side note, um, you know, the New York Times not only does charge for access, but has offered all of its COVID-19, placed all of its COVID-19 content outside the paywall. So uh, if you don't have a subscription, now is the time where you can take a look 
um, at some of these articles and see what they're doing. Um, they have uh, introduced a number of visualizations. So these are interesting because they're not direct trackers. These are all visualizations that are paired up with articles to help explain more complex concepts. So concepts such as uh, flattening the curve in the bottom right, actually showing the different effects of um, different levels of distancing restrictions. Um, and in the bottom left um, is a visualization trying to literally showing how um, viruses uh, get communicated um, or how the COVID-19 virus got communicated outside of China through person-to-person -person connections and how the travel patterns affected where it showed up in the world um, and, and how, it's, how and why it's grown in the specific locations that it has. Finally, to rhyme this out, um, you know, we really wanted to make the point that, um, as always with uh, using data to, to bolster your communications and leveraging data visualization, the main point is to use that data to add real value, right? It isn't about showing data for data's sake or simply trying to show that it's smart. And I think um, here, uh, looking to companies like McKinsey who, um, leverage their ability to gather data, um, visualize it, and communicate it quickly has provided um, a reference point that we've seen a number of other companies turn to, and that is providing a very quick uh, survey on U.S. consumer sentiment, um, which they published a, a couple weeks ago, um, really showing immediately how, that, how consumer sentiment was affected by the current crisis. Um, and more interestingly, I think, showing how it differs. Um, and in fact, one of the big things that they pointed out in this article is that consumer sentiment seems to be affected in a very regional basis. People are more optimistic in the U.S. and in Asia than they are in Europe. Um, and it seems uh, a situation for which they didn't offer a lot of very clear answers, but I think enables them to track it over time and eventually answers those questions. Um, of course, in this, as with, as with a lot of companies, McKinsey is erring on the side of getting the data out as quickly as possible uh, and then developing it over time, developing these same themes through follow-ups, additional data gathering, um, and those sorts of activities. So I will just take a moment to kind of um, wrap up the webinar and um, just kind of share maybe a few short-term um, ideas that we actually have seen. Um, there was an article on business to community community.com that had some really great ideas for, especially for communications and marketing about what to make sure that you're doing right now, maybe some changes to make. So the first was um, an idea around making sure you're taking a moment to adjust marketing campaigns and scheduled content in some of the, the examples that I showed where we had the Spirit Airlines or um, some of the emails that went out could be the case across a lot of marketing um, materials. Things that you may have planned in um, early in the year um, really need to be looked at again to see if they're still appropriate. And if they're not appropriate, is there a way to use the skeleton of what you've created to sort of pivot and make it appropriate in this day and age? So it's really just a, a time to take an audit of what you have and what you're doing, make sure it's in line with what your audience is, is kind of looking for. Um, the other one, which I thought was really helpful, was to take a moment to evaluate your imagery and language. Um, sometimes when we're picking things like stock photography, we're not necessarily always thinking about um, the temperature of our audience and what they're feeling um, or um, the anxiety that they might have. So, you know, just taking extra care not to include sort of pictures of crowds or people touching or um, even changing language, you know, things like um, face to face or hand in hand, all those kind of things. Um, you know, will be trigger points. And just as an example, I was telling John and Kalev that I was watching The Voice the other night, and they it was a taped show, and they were in front of a live audience, and I was just kind of taken aback by how outdated it seemed. And it was only probably recorded earlier this year, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, this is like so last month. This would never happen now. So just being con you know cognizant of what's going on. Um, I think the other two things that were really interesting that this article talked about, one was to be positive and to take advantage of your brand. So 
consumers, clients, employees are getting a lot of negative messages. So trying to be really human and, um, um, you know, keeping in line with your brand, but having a positive note will be well received. Um, and also to Kala's last point, think about what value your brand delivers and try to figure out how you can bring together um, content and communicate the key benefits that you, your business, um, can offer. So those are just some sort of short-term takeaways. Um, to that end, we actually would love to get your thoughts um, in uh, the follow-up materials that you'll receive from this. There's a link to a um, to a survey that we'd love to get some insights on um, about what is going on in your world. Um, this actually will only take less than five minutes. It's a very short survey. Um, but we, this will help us think about what types of content we're creating. Um, and also trying to understand what's going on in our clients and our uh, in marketers and other technologists' minds right now so that we can make sure we're addressing that. Um, and to that end, we've, our, our team across One North has been uh, thinking quite a lot about what is going on with COVID-19 um, and have come up with um, quite a few blog posts around their thoughts um, as it relates to everything from um, personalized communications, um, to <clears throat> how digital engagement is shifting. Um, one of our user experience um, strategists actually did sort of an audit of the professional service organization realm to understand, um, you know, what are the, some of the key takeaways. Um, and I think, you know, two other really interesting articles. One is about um, data visualization that was actually created by the data um, strategy team that's under Kaliv. And finally, three simple steps for successful virtual collaboration. We're using all sorts of new tools with our clients um, to try to, you know, have the same type of work sessions that we would have in normal times. And I say that with air quotes. Um, so just some thoughts and takeaways from some of those virtual collaboration tools. So with that, we say thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. You will get a copy of, you'll get emailed a copy of um, the presentation. And um, we so hope to see you again in the future at another webinar. Thanks, everyone.